Welcome to Up Close, the research, opinion and analysis podcast from the University of Melbourne, Australia. I'm Elizabeth Lopez. Thanks for joining us. Over the past decade, India has undergone a cell phone revolution. Just 10 years ago, there was one telephone for every 40 people in India. And making a phone call was an experience as challenging and risky as bungee jumping or whitewater rafting, according to our next guest. Today, there are 810 million mobile phones in India for a population of 1.2 billion. Mobile or cell phones and wireless technology have transformed just about every facet of Indian society, from politics to courtship and banking. Fishermen check prices at sea and farmers can get crop information and terrorists can plan attacks with deadly efficiency. Our guest on Up Close today is Robin Jeffrey, a visiting research professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies and the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. Robin has written extensively on India's newspaper industry and the politics of media, development and pluralism. He's co-author with anthropologist Asadoron of Selling India, the mobile phone's contribution to capitalism, democracy and unsettling society. Quite an achievement for a small handheld gadget. Thanks for joining us today, Robin. Thank you for having me. In 1949, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, was afflicted by culture shock after a trip to the United States, and he famously pronounced, one should never visit America for the first time. I wonder, Robin, if Nehru would say something similar about India now. Would he recognise his own society, or has the cell phone changed it so much? It's interesting, the tradition of the phone in India. The phone until... 15, 20 years ago was really regarded as an elite item. A nice example of this, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who had one of his ashrams in a place called Warda in central India, had a specially designed telephone box built to his specifications in which to put the telephone, which was regarded as an important item because it was another way of communicating with India and the world. But it was also something that uh, needed to be closely controlled and monitored so that no sort of time-wasting went on using the phone. And Gandhi's phone box at Warda is still part of the display at the ashram. And the key feature for me is, of course, it has a lock on it and somebody had the key and you needed to get the key to get at the phone to make a call. And that situation would have prevailed in India until about 10 years ago. Most people would only have encountered a phone if their boss had unlocked a little box that often contained the big Bakelite phone. And that's the way Nehru, for all of his time in India, experienced the phone. Um, When India became independent in 1947, there was something like one phone for every 3,500 people. By the time Nehru died, that was down to one phone for every 800 people. So there'd been a bit of progress but it still meant that most villages had no telephones at all. Um, Even in smaller towns, there was no telephony. And it's only in the last, uh, since about 2001, 2002, that there's been this immense explosion of telephonic ability in India. You said that the impact can be compared with the invention of the Colt revolver. What does a mobile phone have in common with a gun? Well, I mean, if you're a fan of old grade B westerns on TV, you know that the Colt or the revolver was known as the Great Equaliser. And the reason for calling it the Great Equaliser was that it gave a child or a woman the capacity to have a lethal weapon, which had never been possible before. Any kind of firearm until the invention of the one handheld Colt um, involved two hands. It involves stuffing powder down the barrel of a gun. And a smaller person just found it very difficult to do that. The Colt changed that. It became an equaliser. Mobile phones are a little bit like that. It gives people who previously had no capacity or very limited capacity to communicate that capacity. And they can use that capacity, of course, for good things, bad things, democratic things, dictatorial things. But it does level things out, at least in one facet of life. Certainly not in all facets, but in one. You've written about the impediments to the phone uh, being ubiquitous before, about 10 years ago, things like, well, copper wire being stolen. Mm. What, what other sorts of things prevented regular phones from being taken up? 
as you say, one of the uh, aspects was that copper wire is valuable. A meter of copper wire was supposed to be worth hundreds of rupees. So it was a month's salary 25 years ago if you could get hold of a meter of copper wire. So there was a problem of simply keeping the copper wire network intact. The other problem, of course, was rolling out copper wire. India has 600,000 villages. If you roll copper wire to 600,000 villages, it's a lot of villages. And then you have to still get it, what they call in the business, the last mile to individual receivers in people's homes. So there was a huge physical problem with this. And the other side of it, of course, was the problem of the locked phone box. Until 20 years ago, the elite thought that the phone was a kind of frippery that should be used for government purposes, official purposes, maybe for high business and a little bit of commerce. But for ordinary people, this was a distraction. There's a document from 1977, a document submitted to the Indian Planning Commission saying, we really must discourage this spread of telephony because it's leading to urbanization. Villagers are crowding into the towns because they can now communicate with their villages. And this is a bad thing. We don't want to encourage excessive urbanization. This is a problem. We want to try to keep people down on the farm. So let's not make a big point of getting telephones all over the place because it's going to encourage urbanization. Well, of course, that is precisely the flip side of the way things are now. Migrants move a lot more, partly because, and in that sense, they're Right, partly because they can communicate, they can learn about new opportunities and keep in touch with home once they're away. Can you tell me what sort of advances made the adoption of the phone a possibility on a mass basis? The crucial things, I think, were the liberalisation of the Indian economy that began after 1991, which allowed private companies to begin to try to exploit the new technical capacity to use radio spectrum to communicate individual to individual rather than just a broadcaster communicating to someone's radio set to allow the kind of two-way communication. Now, that was a technological thing which had been developed in Europe in the 1980s. By the early 1990s, it was clear in India that this would be very appropriate to Indian conditions because you didn't need miles of copper wire. Indian capitalists were being encouraged from 1991 to expand and to find foreign collaborations. And one of the areas that cried out for this kind of foreign collaboration, of course, was telecom. And also a change in the mind of the Indian elite that had come with Rajiv Gandhi, that is the um, man who was assassinated in 1991, the husband of Sonia Gandhi, the current president of the Congress party. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi was a big techie. He liked his laptop computer. He'd been an airline pilot and he was sympathetic to trying to push telecom far, far wider and deeper into Indian society. He had been responsible in the 80s in his government between 1984 and 1989 for expanding telecommunications considerably with a whole system of what were called public call offices, setting up little businesses with decent telephone communication for particularly international calls and trunk calls. So for the first time, by about 1986-87, you could go to a little yellow booth that also sold soap powder and cigarettes and so on and get onto a metered telephone and make a call that would actually be connected, an overseas call or a distance call. Much more difficult to make a call within the town in which you were making the call. But nevertheless, it was great if you were calling somebody 50 miles away or 5,000 miles away. Now, Rajiv Gandhi was responsible for that. That process had begun a change in the idea that telecom was a valuable thing, good for the people of India, and should be encouraged and promulgated, if you like. How on earth did banks go about their business in a globalising economy before the cell phone really took root? Well, I think the, the banking story in India is just beginning. We don't yet have anything, as I understand it, the equivalent of PESA, P-E-S-A in Kenya, the big mobile phone-based banking system that's been developed in East Africa. There are the beginnings of this in India. An organization called EKO, ECHO, has about 200,000 banking customers and about 1,200 outlets, but based in Delhi and in the eastern states of Jharkhand and Bihar. And there are a lot of Biharis and Jharkhandi migrant workers in Delhi. And what this uh, nascent operation does is give them the opportunity in Delhi to 
deposit their 25 or 50 rupees that they've earned in the course of the day in an account that is actually operated through their local cigarette shop or grocery store and the mobile phone. And the owner of the store, who's an agent of Echo, uh, records the deposit. They immediately get a receipt for the deposit on their mobile phone while they stand with the shopkeeper. And then they can transmit that receipt to relatives in Jharkhand or Bihar, seven or 800 miles away, who can then go to their shop which is an echo agent, and withdraw the money. So it's a very handy way of getting a population that's largely unbanked into the banking system because the large majority of Indians don't have bank accounts. And really, until you have a bank account, it's hard to get official payments credibly, efficiently paid and recorded. And this has the potential of giving millions of Indians a bank account. But this is, uh, I think, the cutting edge experiment in India with this kind of very simple mobile phone banking that doesn't require you to go into a bank. Often they have long forms that need to be filled out. And it's a pretty off-putting experience for an ordinary person, particularly someone who may not be particularly literate either. And those sorts of banking innovations using mobile phones to do your banking are only really just starting to take hold in advanced economies, but for different reasons. They're more, I suppose, targeted at the the tech-savvy and tech-happy kind of demographic. So it's kind of an interesting um, reflection on on where different countries are in their, their stages of economic development. Yeah, the huge virtue of mobile telephony in India, I think, has been its simplicity in the second generation mode. Even texting is probably less important in India than the use of the audio phone. Uh, Just being able to talk into the phone or use the phone as a kind of message system so that if I give you two rings, you know to bring lunch. And if I give you three rings, you know I'll be coming for lunch. And if I give you four rings, you know that uh, I don't want soup for lunch. The mist call is a great uh, innovation in Indian society. Everybody talks about, just give me a missed call. And that means, just give me a missed call and I'll know exactly it's you and what you want me to do. So that people have a fairly elaborate code system so no one has to take responsibility for picking up a call Uh, and that of course is an advantage too because it keeps price down. I'm sure the phone providers are working on a way to get around that. Indeed. They'd like to be able to charge for every time the phone is used but because the industry at the moment is pretty competitive and because people are so price sensitive you lose customers if you don't give them the services they're accustomed to. And poor people are terribly price sensitive. And of course, of these 810 million Indian phone subscribers today, the large majority of them are poor people. That is very poor people living on three, four dollars a day, perhaps. So a phone has to be cheap and the use of a phone has to be cheap. So using a cell phone, you don't necessarily need to be literate for it either. Yes, it is the huge advantage that does again make this object, the cell phone, the equaliser, because you don't have to be able to read and write. Um, If you can memorise, and illiterate people often have very, very good memories, if you can memorise what 14 keys on a keypad do and what combinations you can use them to get particular results, then you can make this thing work. And, of course, you can make audio calls where you're talking your own language, not having to write in somebody else's language or read in somebody else's language. You talk your own dialect to people you know. Can you tell me a bit about the impact of the cell phone on on labourers working in remote areas of India, the farmers and the fisher folk? What do they use it for? How has it transformed their lives and their work? I mean, Indian labour is terribly mobile at the moment. I was at a conference not long ago where it was speculated in any one day there are 100 million people footloose, that is, moving between city and town, working in towns briefly before coming back to their villages, really having to divide their time between their native villages and the towns. Now, the mobile phone has, just as the 1977 report feared, made it a little bit easier to be mobile because you can keep in touch with home But you can also hear about opportunities. So if somebody from your village says, look, they need labourers in this or that place, they'll ring you and tell you and you can get there. So that's one thing. It's made labour even more mobile than it might have been under other circumstances. The other side is that for small business, the mobile has been pretty useful, I think. The classic case and one that's been written about many times now are fishermen off the southwest coast of India who 10 years ago got mobile phones and it made it 
safer. They had pretty good coverage even out to sea, out to 10, 15 miles. And these are small-time fishermen who wouldn't go much beyond that. So it meant they could have weather warnings. But more than that, once they had a catch, they could ring two or three possible destinations and find out where the prices were best. So the whole kind of pricing could be done more effectively, more economically. Now, traders, of course, can do that too. They can set up their own little cartel and say, ring three traders up and down the coast and say, we all give the same price today, don't we? And work it out that way. But again, it's a little more equal than it was before when the the trader might have had an old Bakelite copper line phone in his office and the person outside the fisherman had no other way of communicating. So... You're listening to Up Close. I'm Elizabeth Lopez and I'm talking with Professor Robin Jeffrey about the impact of the cell phone on India. Robin, speaking of phoning home, what has been the impact on traditions like courtship and on the status of women? That's one of the great questions that's being posed by the phone. My colleague Asi Doron is an anthropologist and the book we're writing, he's working on these domestic questions and I'm working more on the politics and political economy. But just to give you one example that Asi has found a number of times with people he's acquainted with over his years of working in North India, um, the question now that's often posed in joint families is when a new daughter-in-law arrives in a family, does the mother-in-law take away the girl's mobile phone or does she allow her to keep her mobile phone? And it's a question that gets answered differently from one family to another. And I guess we're very curious to know whether there are any common patterns about generation or caste or region of India where the keeping of the mobile phone or the taking of the mobile phone is more prevalent uh, than not. But certainly it's a question that never had to be asked before. The daughter-in-law used to come in and was expected to be a good daughter-in-law, but now she's expected to be a good daughter-in-law, but the question is with or without a mobile phone. And courtship, people meeting. Both wonderful and terrible stories. Uh, It's pretty hard to read an Indian newspaper for a week or a fortnight without finding stories of uh, young people being beaten up or killed by their relatives for having assignations that they shouldn't be having using the mobile phone. And of course, the mobile phone gets blamed for a lot of this. There was a story some of your listeners may have seen reported because it got international coverage where a village not too far from Delhi um, proposed to ban the mobile phone for anybody under a certain age and particularly for young girls because they thought it was just bad stuff. This is worse than sex and drugs and rock and roll, the, uh, this mobile phone stuff, because you can get up to a lot of mischief on a mobile phone. As we know, people can get up to a lot of mischief. You've written that the cell phone has allowed pornography to be disseminated on an unprecedented scale. How does that work? Um, well, it's not hard, of course, to make pornography with a mobile phone. Uh, we've got plenty of examples from around the world. Indian pornography long ago used to require a terrific imagination because the printing was pretty awful. And the whole technology of taking a photograph and then reproducing it and printing it was pretty ponderous. But it's not that way now. I mean, one fairly decent mobile phone will allow you to do photography of a very high quality and the pornography follows from that. So again, my colleague Asi has uh, plenty of examples of the working class people that he's dealt with where the pornography on their phone is part of it. Uh, You have your religious texts and messages on one part of your phone and then another file you in the phone you have your pornography so you keep them apart you don't let uh, religious things mix with the pornography but they're all sort of sitting there in the memory of your particular mobile phone so good and evil you know good and bad all kind of lurking in the mobile phone this must make sexual politics quite complicated because uh, are we still talking about a time in which bollywood films still don't allow kissing I think you might get the odd peck occasionally. And I mean, not allowing kissing never prevented starlets from standing under waterfalls and sort of body hugging saris. So, you know, Bollywood's always found ways of getting around minor things like government censorship to get the idea across, if not the precise image. Robin, let's turn now to the impact of the cell phone on politics. When Barack Obama was elected US president, a large part of the success of that campaign was attributed to the Democrats' use of social media, in particular Facebook. 
You suggest something analogous may have happened with the mobile phone in the 2007 elections in Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state. And in fact, the victory went to the underdog, the Bahujan Samaj Party, whose constituent base is largely made up of untouchables or, or Dalits. What, what happened there? What we think happened is that um, the Bahujan Samaj Party, as you say, was founded on a Dalit base, an untouchable base. That was its main source of support. Founded by a man called Kanchi Ram, who devoted his life to building a cadre of people like himself who were Dalits with a powerful ideological commitment to winning political power to try to overcome some of the oppression and prejudice that Dalits faced. Now, Kanchi Ram had built this network of highly motivated followers by riding around on a bicycle on Sunday afternoons and getting them to do it too, to carry the message to villages and to people like themselves in remote corners of the country. So he'd built a cadre of devoted workers. Um, 2007 was the first time those devoted workers had mobile phones. So instead of bicycles, the kind of organization they had was able to communicate using cell phones. And the organization was such that um, there were booth captains for every polling booth in UP. The Bahujan Samaj was that effective. Virtually every polling booth. 100,000 polling booths. This is a, a big operation. And they were receiving and sending messages on what they were to do on particular days throughout the campaign. How they were to organize local meetings and the stories they were to be telling and the actual tasks of getting people on the rolls, making sure that people on the rolls knew how they were to vote. And this was done largely through text messages and through audio phone calls through a highly structured organizational system. So the mobile phone, again, it's the the notion that you're giving a new weapon to people who already had a cause and a, a belief. And this new weapon was extremely effective. They had another element in that campaign that is credited with bringing the victory to the Bahujan Samaj party was the fact that they were able to put together an alliance between Dalits, untouchables at the bottom of the old social scale, and Brahmins at the top of the old social scale. And that combination in electoral terms amounted to probably 30% of the population of Uttar Pradesh. So if most of those people voted for the same candidate, you were well on the way to winning an election with a first-past-the-post system. Now, that was a difficult story to tell. How do you tell high-status people you should vote for the same candidate as those low-status people and vice versa? And that story was told through hundreds of meetings at village and small town level of Brahmins and Dalits where leaders explained, look, we have things in common. If we unite on this, we can do both sides some good. We really don't have anything dividing us now. The Constitution of India says we're equal. There are other people who have interests that are far more adversarial to ours than we Brahmins and we Dalits, we should unite. Now, that's a fairly sophisticated story. It had to be told repeatedly across a a state that would, if it were an independent sovereign state, be bigger than Japan. It'd be the fifth biggest country in the world if UP, Uttar Pradesh, were independent. So this was a huge task to perform. Our line is that the mobile phone enabled the Bahujan Samaj Kader to tell this story and get their people to the polls uh, as they would never have been able to do in the old days when their founder, Kanchi Ram, was peddling his bicycle on Sundays. So it's the difference between a bicycle and an electronic communications device. In the space of 10 years. Yes. Extraordinary. Have the um, political opponents of Bahujan Samaj caught up in terms of their use of the cell phone for their political campaigning? Very much. Everybody loves the cell phone and others imitate it. People who were with the BSP in 2007 have since left them and taken the technique with them. But of course, it's not the cell phone by itself. It's the cadder, the dedicated true believers plus the cell phone. Cell phone won't do you any good if you've got nobody motivated enough to take the message and go out and act on the message. You still need people who will act on the messages they're getting. The Congress party in May of 2011, there were state elections in four of the Indian states. The Congress party, particularly in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, had all the technological wizardry it could possibly have hoped for and came up a very disappointing result. The technology alone was not enough. They didn't have the true believers using the technologies. And I suppose it favours the nimble, doesn't it? So a small party might do better out of 
using technology. Yes, again, if the belief is there and you've got the workers to transmit it, and if you're telling a story, of course, that a particular electorate finds vaguely plausible, then you've got a pretty potent combination. You're listening to Up Close. I'm Elizabeth Lopez and I'm talking with Professor Robin Jeffrey about the impact of the cell phone on India. Have you been able to observe impacts on how ordinary Indians use public services and I guess hold public servants or bureaucracies to account? Has there been a discernible effect on that? I think so. Again, with the elections, the 2007 elections in Uttar Pradesh were said to be one of the fairest, straightest, best organised elections ever held, partly because the election officials and the police officials providing them with the security, were all connected by mobile phones. And it meant that anyone detecting misconduct could ring an election commission officer and a flying squad of police would arrive or an election commission official would arrive. On polling day, it also meant that if there was any argy-bargy going on around polling booths, people had mobile phone numbers for officials who could be rung. So it made for a much more tightly controlled fairer election. And that, of course, benefits an underdog party too. The more powerful people find it more difficult to intimidate voters, keep hostile voters away from the polls and so on. You sound a note of caution about the democratising potential of the Mm. cell phone. What are your hesitations based on? Well, I mean, it can be used as a monitor of where people are at particular times. You can, of course, trace people back to their mobile phone. So people with power can use the mobile phone as a way of tracking those who are opposed to them. So it can be used for all those surveillance techniques that many people fear. And similarly, the powerful still enjoy huge advantages simply because they're wealthier, they have bigger cars and fancier mobile phones than the poor. So it's not hard to imagine the mobile phone being used to maintain the power structures that already exist. But for the time being, at least, it is a new kind of weapon. The other comparison we've used when we've been trying to think about just what this means is with shoes. You know, shoes were probably the earliest human communications device. Some people had them and some people didn't. The ultimate male chauvinist put-down begins with barefoot and then goes on to pregnant and in the kitchen. Take away somebody's shoes and you disempower them. Take away their mobile phone and you disempower them. Give them shoes and they can do things they couldn't do before. Give them a mobile phone and they can do things they didn't do before. And we don't wear our shoes in bed usually, but lots of people take their mobiles to bed. Revolutions are notorious for eating their own children, and this one is no exception. Uh, And in 2011, a former communications minister was arrested over allegations that he manipulated the allocation of spectrum for 2G services. The Indian government ended up getting a minuscule sum in licence fees from the big telcos, and the allocation process itself was bizarre, as as Mm. you've written. Yes, I mean, the two allocations of spectrum that we've currently had have both ended up with the ministers involved being implicated in criminal proceedings. The minister in charge of 1G back in the 1990s has been convicted, though he's never served time in jail, but has been convicted and is still out on bail. The minister in charge of the 2G operation of four years ago is currently charged and being held in a prison in Delhi. The stakes in this allocation of radio frequency are huge. India's largest capitalists are involved in bidding for and then using radio frequency spectrum because there are hundreds of millions of dollars at play in this. And the allegations are that the 2G spectrum, when it was allotted in about 2007, 2008, was done through a process that was highly inappropriate with money changing hands to ensure that that inappropriate process benefited some companies and not others. And the government of India is thought to have lost a lot of money as a result of this rather arbitrary process. We're talking potentially a few billion? We're talking billions of dollars. According to uh, one report, had the spectrum been auctioned instead of allocated, the fees coming to the government of India would have been much higher. Robin, you're not at all reticent in wanting your research to be a basis for, for better policy. What's missing right now from telecommunications policy in India? 
that's a very good question. Uh, I think a much more empowered regulator, the TRAI, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, is kind of a toothless tiger. And although it often has good documents in front of it, it finds it very difficult to have those proposals implemented. There's still a, a bit of a struggle, too, between the, the government, which has a very strong hold through its Department of Transport. The government still owns two telecom companies. The Department of Transport and Telecommunications attempts to assert its control over radio spectrum, often constraining the rollout of services looking to protect its own interests. The regulator is often beholden to the government department. So a more powerful regulator or a regulator genuinely empowered, I think would make a, a big difference in equalizing some of the terms amongst the various providers of telecom and thereby probably improving the kinds of services that would become available. Though the Indian consumer for basic services can't complain too much because calls are very cheap. And the service now is covering, in a fairly reliable way, 80 to 90 percent of the country. There must be some pretty unlikely places where mobile phone towers are located. Well, there are said to be 350,000 towers in India in 2011, with 150,000 still needing to be built. So there's a whole industry around putting up mobile phone towers. But in a state like Himachal Pradesh, which is the Himalayan state north of Delhi. Himachal has very good mobile phone coverage in spite of the fact that it's terribly hilly and mountainous, but almost every little promontory has a mobile phone tower on it. Seven companies provide services in Himachal, and Himachal has one of the largest take-ups among its people of mobile phones of anywhere in India. And you can understand why, because in the past you would have had to walk down valleys and around the side of hills to get from one place to another. It might have taken a day to travel a distance of four or five miles because of the nature of the terrain. Now you can make a call in, in seconds. So it, the mobile phone's been a terrific transformer in places like that. Has the service gone digital? Uh, indeed, yes. 3G is now being introduced. It's been rolled out for the last eight or ten months, that is throughout 2011, and that will spread. But uh, 3G, of course, is more expensive. And the virtues of the service at the moment lie in the fact that it's cheap and it's audio. It's cheap and it's simple. And that's what makes it such a powerful medium in a country where most people are poor and still 40% of the population are illiterate. Professor Robin Jeffrey, thanks so much for being our guest on Up Close today. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I've enjoyed it. That was historian and political analyst Dr Robin Jeffrey. Relevant links, a full transcript and more info on this episode can be found at our website at upclose.unimelb.edu.au. Up Close is a production of the University of Melbourne, Australia. This episode was recorded on the 16th of June 2011 and our producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Parham. Audio engineering by Gavin Neighbour. Up Close is created by Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel. I'm Elizabeth Lopez. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Up Close. For more information, visit upclose.unimelb.edu.au. Copyright 2011, the University of Melbourne.